Philemon in chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says this. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold. This is an apostle talking right here. He says, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul. I like that. An old man, he's only 60 years old right here, but the apostle felt like he's getting older. He's about 60 years old at this age. He says, now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, listen to this part, he was useless to you. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could help take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. Verse 14. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that Any favor you would do would not seem forced, but would be voluntarily. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. You could take your seats today, and my title of the message this morning is In the Room with an Apostle. Here today, I want to look at Onesimus, a runaway slave who found himself a prisoner in Rome, sailed up with the Apostle Paul. This chapter is actually a letter that the Apostle Paul personally wrote on behalf of this runaway slave by the name of Onesimus. It speaks of the reconciliation that he wants to see take place between Onesimus and his previous owner, Philemon. He writes this letter for him, and he begins to testify, or he begins to talk about the transformation that has taken place in this young man's life. There's three people we could take note of in this chapter, one of them being the Apostle Paul, another of them being Philemon, And thirdly, Onesimus, the main person I want to preach about to you here today. Onesimus, his name by definition actually means helpful, it means useful, and it also means profitable. As you know, in biblical times, names are significant in people's lives. But how many of us know not all the time does everybody live up to their name? (laughs) Onesimus is one of those people who had a big name, but he lived a little life. He had a name of something he was supposed to do and greatness he was supposed to achieve. He had a high calling, but he was living a low life. The Bible says that there was something happened in his life that he had actually, and it's believed, he stole from his master. He was under a leader by the name of Philemon, who was actually a friend of the Apostle Paul, who was converted by the preaching of the Apostle Paul, a wealthy man, a member of the church in Colossae. It was believed he had a, what we like to call a connect group, or he had a house church. If you look at the, in Roman times, they actually had a lot of what would we like to call house churches all over Rome. And Philemon, when one of those leaders, Philemon was one of those leaders, and under his leadership was this man by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus had sticky hands. It's believed that he stole from his master. And he ran to Rome trying to run away from the leadership and run away from the church and run away from those who invested into his life and try to find himself hiding in the midst of Rome. How many of us know We could hide from man, but we can never hide from God. And when there's a calling upon our life, when there's a mission upon our life, God has a way of catching up to us. God has a way of closing doors, rerouting destinies, and putting us right where he wants us. God positioned this man by the name of Onesimus to find himself in prison with an apostle where God began to work on his life. 
Paul worked on this man, and we're going to talk about what he worked on. And he actually wrote a whole letter on his behalf that his leader would receive him back into leadership. There's three things we're able to pick up from this letter that the Apostle Paul was able to work on Onesimus. Now, many people preach about forgiveness out of this book, about how uh, Paul wanted Philemon to forgive Onesimus. But I want to also not just look at that. I want to look at the transformation that took place as Onesimus was in the presence of an apostle. The apostle was intentional with this man. The apostle seen a runaway slave come into his presence. He's seen a, a, a person who was untrustworthy. He's seen a person who lacked morals. He's seen a person who lacked character. He's seen a person who was not trusted. And he said, that's exactly the person that I see potential in. And God could change his life. So he began to work on him. And he began to help him identify three things. One thing that he helped him identify, you could write this down, is he helped him find his weak spot. And I want to challenge us today that we would look at our life and say, I want to find my weak spot. Because every single one of us have a weak spot. Can you help me today? Philemon understood that Onesimus had a weak spot, and Onesimus came to realize that he had a weak spot as well, and that was that he was a thief. He was unloyal and untrustworthy, and he would run away from his problems. Hebrews 12, I love what it says. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, listen to this part, and the sin that so easily entangles us. It's not sins that so easily entangles us. It's sin that so easily entangles us. The weak spot we have, every single one of us, I don't care how strong you are, how good you dress, how nice your hair is, how good your bags are. If we could all be honest today, every one of us have a weak spot. We have something in our life we struggle with. There is that one thing. Now, some of us, we got a lot of things, but, and I'm one of those a lot of things people, but there's one thing that just keeps you slipping. There's one thing that's a continual struggle. There's one thing that's a continual battle. There's a weak spot in our life that so easily entangles us. And we need to recognize what it is and say, God, this is an area that I want you to change me in. This is an area I'm going to work on. This is an area I'm not going to let destroy me. This is an area I'm going to invest in that I could conquer. This is an area I'm not going to let take me out. And maybe it's an area that for your rest of your journey, you're going to have to keep an eye on. There's giants I've killed in my life when I first got saved, and I didn't know that giants could raise from the dead sometimes. And I'm working, and I'm laboring, and I'm giving myself to the ministry, and all of a sudden, the giant's is tapping on my shoulder again. And I said, I killed you many years ago. I put you in the grave many years ago, but I didn't recognize that I need to keep checking up on that giant. I need to make sure that giant stays in the ground. I need to keep praying against that battle. I need to keep fasting against that struggle. I need to keep reading the word of God and get scriptures to fight that giant because it could get up from the grave and come and try to kill me in the future. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? There's weak spots that every single one of us have, and we need to recognize it and battle against it. The one thing that so easily entangles us. Do you know your one thing? Have you identified the one thing that so easily entangles? Some of you are squirming right now. (laughs) Because we all have one thing, a weak spot, that so easily entangles us. The apostle recognized in Onesimus there was a weak spot, and he was going to help him make the weak spot his strong spot. You know, God has the ability to do that. 
We don't always have to live under, under being defeated or under, under an area of being uh, lording over us and ruling over us. God has the power and the ability to turn that weak spot into a strong spot. I've seen people have marriage problems when they come into the house of God. They, they weren't able to treat their wife the way they should be treated. But the presence of God began to change their heart and change their mind and change their character. And those same people who are on the brink of divorce are counseling people to not get a divorce or doing marriage counseling with people that they could have a successful marriage because that is the God we serve. He's able to do it. You believe that today? Nisimus had a weak spot and the apostle Paul had to bring it out to him. When I think about weak spots and I think about the first weak spot we find in, in the history of mankind, I can't help think but the Garden of Eden. It was the first time in history that a weak spot was exposed. And you know who it was? It was Eve, the woman. Eve had a weak spot. You know what her weak spot was? She didn't know the word. And it wasn't just Eve's fault that she didn't know the word. It was her husband's fault because he's the one who got the word first. God gave word to the man, and the man is supposed to give word to the woman. You ain't, you ain't making no noise right there. The man got the word of what God wanted them to do, what God wanted them not to do. And he was supposed to speak that word over his family and speak that word over his marriage and make sure his wife clearly understood what God wanted them to do and what God wanted them not to do. But he failed in the area of bringing clarity to the word of God to his wife. It says, the apostle Paul says that, let us not fall astray by false doctrine like Eve in the garden. Eve had a weak spot and that was she didn't know her word. But let me say something else. It wasn't only that. It was that she fellowship with poisonous people. We're not supposed to fellowship with snakes. We're supposed to trample snakes. And Eve thought it was a good idea to have conversation with the serpent. And there in the garden, she began to talk with the serpent. She began to fellowship with the serpent. Now, I don't believe that it was just a one-time occasion. I believe it was a continual conversation. That Eve would talk with the serpent, and the serpent may tell her some truth and some things she wanted to hear. And over time, the serpent began to develop a credibility with Eve. And over time, he began to tell her some half-truths. How many know the devil tells us half-truths sometimes? And he began to develop a trust with her. You know salesmen, they have a harder time selling to women than they do men. Man, they say, yeah, you want this, you want this, you want this car, man, it's got this much horsepower, the paint is this, the calipers, the package is this. The men say, here's my card, let's do it. But the women, they're a little bit harder to sell to. You got to gain trust with women. You got to develop credibility with the woman. And Eve began to fellowship with the serpent, a poisonous thing. And that was her weak spot. She fellowshiped with poisonous things. I think some of us are guilty of that sometimes. We have relationships in our life that don't strengthen us, they weaken us. We have people in our circle sometimes that don't want us to change. And they like the fact that we have a struggle. You know why? Because they benefit off of our struggles. And a person who's a friend to your weakness, they're an enemy to your destiny. We need to recognize not everyone is our friend, nor is everyone around us going to help us get to our destiny. And sometimes God wants to give us a new circle. That's why he put us where we are. That's why we're meeting the people that we're meeting. That's why we're surrounded with this people group God has put around us because he doesn't want you to just be around poisonous people. He wants you to be around healthy people. He wants you to be around promised people. He wants you to be around people who are not going to empathize and contribute to your weakness but they're going to contribute to your strength. They're going to make you stronger. They're going to make you wiser. They're going to make you more godly. They're going to help you walk in your destiny. Well, you have to look 
Who am I surrounded with? <laughs> and, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's okay because I really feel we're going to talk about this. The Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one brother sharpens another. You can't be, you could be sharpened by iron, but you can't be sharpened by plastic. You get sharpened by people made of iron. And you need to surround yourself with people that are solid. People that have been put through the fire and did not get quenched. People that have been through some battles but did not surrender, did not heal, did not let their faith get crippled, did not let their life end up in staying in the dumps, but they arose and said, God was with me, God is for me. The word of God says I'm going to make it through, and I stand upon that word. That's the kind of people we need to surround ourselves with. We want to be sharp in this place. I don't want to be dull. There's, a, there's a, a passage in the Bible where they wanted to use axes to chop down a tree. And they, the, the prophet said, grab the axe. And he swung the axe and he hit the tree. And the axe had fell off and fell into the lake. Because it was dull. It was not sharp. They were going to build the house of God. But the problem was they had something that was dull, not something that was sharp. And when we're building the house of God, our edge will be exposed. Whether we're sharp or whether we're dull. And you want to get sharper? We need to get some iron around us. We need to get some solid men and solid women in our corner, in our circle, that will sharpen us to become all God's called us to be. Come on, someone clap your hands if you're hearing me today. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. I feel good company enhances good morals. You agree with that today? Understand today, when God wants to raise you up, he'll send someone into your life. The devil will also send someone, send someone as well to destroy your life. And as vital as men and as women, we recognize our enemies from our allies. And we let people around us and let people surround us who are going to help work on our weak spots that they could become our strong spots. And a way that's going to help us to decipher the people that we need and the people that we need to surround, uh, disconnect ourselves with is beginning to build our life around our calling. When you build your life around your calling, wrong relationships will die and right relationships will be birthed. When you build your life around your calling, you recognize this is the best way to disconnect from the wrong people because you become determined to do the right thing. And when you're determined to do the right thing, you know what happens? Those wrong people get irritated by you. <laughs> it's okay, though, because they weren't going to help you get to your destiny. They were an enemy to your destiny, but God wants to bring some people around you. They're going to help you get to your destiny. Somebody clap your hands if you agree with that here this morning. The enemy wants to target our weak spot and take us out. I was recently studying, and I read this, and it's so profound, that 85% of violent crimes in America, attacks that take place, happen to people who are alone. 85% of crimes that take place on people, they are people who are always alone. And that's exactly the way the enemy works, just the way the enemy works. The Bible says Satan prowls around looking for some victim to devour. 1 Peter 5.8. The word is victim, not victims. Because... You make the devil think twice when you have good people around you. That's why the enemy wants to isolate you and separate you and push you away and keep you by yourself because it's when you're alone that he has his way within your life. It's when we're isolated that he begins to prowl and work on our weak spot. Let us accept the weak spot. 
But when we have man and great woman beside us, we make him think twice when he wants to knock on our door. We make him think twice when he wants to mess with our family. We make him think twice when he wants to try to derail us from our destiny because he sees we are not alone. We have people on our team who are going to fight on our behalf. He works on our weak spot so that he could take us from our destiny. This man, Onesimus, had a weak spot that the Apostle Paul helped him recognize and helped him deal with and overcome that he could step into his destiny. I want to challenge us today. Identify our weak spot. Identify the thing that so easily entangles you. And for myself, I've, I've recognized it. I know what it is. It's not my friend. It's my enemy. I read books about it. I memorize scriptures about it. Daily I pray against it. I recognize the one thing that easily entangles me. I know my weak spot. And I know my weak spot isn't going to take me out. It's going to become my strong spot. Second thing is, the Apostle Paul helped him not only find his weak spot, but he helped him find his power spot. He said this in verse 15 and 16, Perhaps this reason he was separated you from a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. What was he telling him? He's going to be a team member in your ministry now. He said before he was a rebel, before he was no good, before he was going to work against you. But I've been working on him. I helped him identify his gifting. I helped him recognize his power spot. And he's leaving this prison not as a slave no more, but he's going to be a helper within your ministry. You used to have a different perspective about him before I put my hands on him. But I challenge you, look at him different because he is now a person who's going to benefit the ministry. And a person who helps benefit the ministry is someone who's identified their power spot. God's gifted every single one of us differently. We look different, we sound different, we're gifted different. And we need to find out that power spot that God wants us to operate in. You know what happens when you operate in your power spot? You become powerful. When you're not in your power spot, you become weak. Things aren't fun. Things aren't exciting. You won't find yourself happy because you're trying to do something you weren't meant to do. Be in a lane you're not called to. I'd be sad if I tried to be a worship leader. I would be devastated if I tried to get on the keys and play the keyboard. Uh, why don't they ever play me? Why don't they ever put me up? It's not my power spot. But if I could get in my power spot. I'll be happy. I'll be content. I'll know God. I'm right where God wants me to be. I know what he's called me to do. I know the giftings he's put inside of me. And I'm going to be a good steward with every gift he's entrusted unto me. I'm going to work my lane and give God glory. Do you know your power spot? Getting in a room with leaders, they're going to help you find your power spot. There's room for everybody to serve in this place. I love about our ministry is we're a team ministry in here. And as a team ministry in this place, there's room for everybody to serve. And better believe it is that as you begin to get involved and as you give yourself to this ministry, you're going to begin to see God not only identify your weak spot, but God begin to reveal to you your power spot. And it's important when you recognize that power spot, you begin to verbalize with others what you feel God is calling you to do and the gifting he's put inside of you. There's a gift he has locked up in every single one of us, and we need to start letting God get glory as we use it. It is a scary thing to start using gifts, though. Let me just say that. You know, if someone has a certain gift, it's a scary thing to start using it. But it's just like riding a bike. Just start using it. Start the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. And we need to start letting God get glory from the giftings he's put inside of us and let our power spot be used for God's glory and be used for God's honor. We shouldn't just give it to the world. 
I mean, we serve the world, don't get me wrong. But God should get glory from the gifting he's put in us. Do you agree with that today? The Apostle Paul began to help this man identify his power spot. He said he was useless. Now he has become useful. He became someone who knew where God wanted him to be and was empowered to operate in the lane God called him to. Find your power spot and be powerful in it. Third thing, last thing I want to bring out. He not only found his weak spot and found his power spot, but lastly, he helped him find his God spot. God said, this man's been transformed. This man's been changed. In verse 12, he says, he is my very heart. And now I'm sending him back to you. He said, you're going to have him not for a little while, but you're going to have him back forever. How many of you want to be around forever? That was weak. How many want to be around forever? He said, you're going to be around forever. He's going to be someone of longevity. He's going to be someone in his God spot. God worked on Onesimus, changed, helped him change, helped him transform, helped him become great, helped him find his weak spot, his power spot. But his destiny was not just being developed in there with the apostle. His destiny was to a people and to a place. And this is what's crazy right here. He had to get this letter from the apostle from prison, take it with him as he's checking out of there, and carry it back to the person he burned. It seems scary. You know why it's scary? Because Philemon could have killed him in that moment. Philemon could have branded him with the F on his head for being a fugitive. And he had full right to kill that man. But Onesimus, in the face of danger, he knew the safest place for me is in God's spot. The safest place for my life is to be in the God spot of where God wants me to be and what God wants me to do. And he understood I'm safer in God's will than I am outside of God's will. God's will sometimes seems scary. It seems dangerous. It doesn't make sense. But that's where God begins to perform miracles. And, and, and it's in that place when we're against adversity. It's in that place. We're in, the, in, in, in a place where it doesn't logically make sense. If God called us to it, it's the perfect place we need to be. Stay in the God spot for your life. Don't ever get out of where God has called you to be. Don't ever separate yourself where God has destined you to be. Stay in the God spot where God has called your life. There's three different types of, you know, people who follow the will of God. You could be in the permissible will of God, where what you're doing is permissible. It's okay. You're not doing wrong. But you're in the permissible will of God. You could be in the pleasing will of God, where you're pleasing God with what you do. You're honoring God for what you do. It's pleasing to you, and it's pleasing to God where you are. Or you could be in the perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is you being exactly where God wants you to be, doing what he's called you to do, and living according to his purpose and plan he has for your life. I decided I want to stay in the God spot, and I want to live my life in the perfect will of God. How many of you agree with that here today? You want to be the same way. As the worship team comes, I want everyone to stand all over this place. Onesimus is a great testimony of a person who let a leader put his hands on his life, who let someone work with him, who didn't run away from the process, but let God reveal to him his weak spot, let God position him in his power spot, and decided that he wanted to live in his God spot. I think the same thing wants to happen to God wants to happen to every single one of us under the sound of my voice today. And I feel right now he wants to strengthen some people. I feel right now he wants to give clarity to some people. I feel right now he wants to just move in your life. 
So today I want to do something very simple. I want to just open up the altars for anybody here today who you say, I just want to spend time in the presence of Jesus. I want to spend time in the presence of God. I want God to speak to me. I want God to move in me. I want God to direct my life, direct my path. Some of you have big decisions coming up in front of you. You have decisions that are going to shift your family and shift your life, shift your ministry, shift your business. And you need God's direction in your life. Where you are today, if you want to seek the presence of God, I want to ask you to come forward today. We're going to have a time of prayer this morning. We're going to seek God, position ourselves in a place.